forth, telling them, stating who exactly is pulling this information and for what purpose. And uh, it's certainly kept very confidential per the state regulations that we're licensed under. Mm -hmm. What forms are the, is the insurer going to be required to sign who, who would like to utilize a life settlement? Well. They're going to they're sign a, a processing agreement for us to process and, and realize that we're going to uh, work on their behalf as a settlement uh, broker for them, an application with their basic health information on it, um, a policy release form, a medical release form um, to allow us to pull all the pertinent information to mm -hmm. package that policy for sale, as it were. Mm -hmm. um, are there restrictions as to how the proceeds can be utilized? I'll say no. As long as they're legal, certainly they're you know, able to Spend, they're spending their cash at that point, it's theirs, and they can do with it as they wish. Mm -hmm. Are there restrictions as far as how long you need to take to get the process done? Is the legalities regarding that? No, not to my knowledge in these okay. states yet. Okay. okay. As long as it takes us to collect all the information, get it. The, the process is six, six simple steps. You make an application, we collect all the medical information and obtain life expectancy reports for the insured. Mm -hmm. We then send that information out in a package for uh, all the potential buyers to, to look at and view. And usually in a week to two, they'll get offers back to us. At that point, we negotiate with all the buyers to make sure that the highest one, uh, that all the ones short of the highest one have an offer to, you mm -hmm. know, change their bid to, to max out to, uh, you know, compete for that max bid, mm -hmm. and then at the point that we have a winning bidder on the policy, then that buyer prepares their closing package, ships it out to the uh, old, to the current policy owner mm -hmm. uh, for sale and signature by all the beneficiaries and everybody involved potentially in that policy. Then it comes back, all the due diligence is done, and then the checks released to to the uh, policy owner. Mm -hmm. And you must face a lot of skepticism in this, I man. I can't imagine how some people can realize this monthly bill or quarterly bill, whatever bill they're getting, this can actually be used as an asset. They can get liquidity from this. It's amazing. It's monetizing. It's monetizing a non-liquid asset, and it is. Mm -hmm. It's. We catch a lot of people off guard with the idea that they can sell something that they see as a bill and actually drive you know money from it. I. I my. You know, consistently hear from clients. Are you sure you realize this policy has no cash value? Mm -hmm. Like we're not, can, you know, not worried about its cash value other than as a relative mark to what we can get for you. Mm -hmm. But it has all to do with the type of policy, the insurance company, and uh, the yearly cost of that policy multiplied by someone's life expectancy. Mm -hmm. It's a fairly simple math, although the um, all the determining factors, you know, take a bit to pull those together. As a licensed life insurance, life settlement broker, um, do you have several avenues for investors? And do you look at all those avenues to see who can get your client, if you will, the most uh, liquidity from that policy? As a rule, we send our policies out to every state licensed provider or buyer. They call You're providers. required to do so. Well, we're not required to do so, but in the idea of, again, using us as a broker and we're compensated off the max amount that we get you, much like you would when you, you know, use an agent to sell a house, yeah. we want to get all the bidders that we can to drive the price as high as we can to maximize everybody's mm -hmm. uh, number. How long have you been involved in doing life settlements? How long have you been doing this? Uh, a little over three years now. Three years now. And it has mm -hmm. certainly been a changing, uh, a changing process. Um, I imagine you've helped a lot of people out in, who are in, in need, in great we need. We absolutely have. Again, we face that, that skepticism or that, that mm -hmm. confusion that we can turn a bill into actual money. Yeah. Uh, it certainly confuses people or, yeah. or puts them off. And again, that statistic of about 85% of our uh, potential client list don't know we exist. So spreading 85%. the word. 85%. 85%. So certainly mm -hmm. in the idea of, you know, you have me on today and certainly all that we do through the web and other avenues to, to, mm -hmm. to breach that subject and get that out there in the forefront. Uh, insurance companies spend a lot of money to keep us and keep that concept down, mm -hmm. but we certainly would like to do all we can to uh, educate the consumers on the possibility of it. It's right. not right for everyone and not everyone, you know. Well, and what benefit. situation may it not be right for someone? Um, well, someone that still needs their, their insurance policy for the reasons they got it in the first place, whether it's to cover uh, potential devastating loss or to cover uh, the tax bill on their estate, right. um, and they can still afford to make those payments, and they should keep the policy. This isn't a trade-off for that. This isn't, you know, um, some miracle of, of getting them more money now than they could ultimately, through all the costs, get later. Right. It, it surely, usually, uh, comes down to whether someone can afford to keep the policy in force or not, 90% of the time. There are a few other you know, caveats that, that uh, offers uh, explanations why people get rid of them. But hands down, most of the time, it's because someone can no longer afford them to keep these policies up. Mm -hmm. Ray, I want to go back a few steps and uh, discuss what are some of the other factors that an insurer can contest? 
Well, essentially, an insurance company can contest anything they feel has been concealed or misrepresented in the initial application, something that was uh, either left out or just didn't address properly, medical conditions, or just about anything. Have you had uh, the insurers contest that on, on people that you've been working with? But not on a life settlement because they're, it's you know, no one will buy a life insurance policy in the contestability period, at least mm -hmm. in normal fronts. So they have to be out of that contestability period mm -hmm. uh, for this, just that sake because if not, then the policy can be void and then all premiums are returned and you don't get that death mm -hmm. benefit. Mm -hmm. The person buying it would be out all the money they spent to buy that policy. Right. You mentioned medical records. You said that they were required for you to do what you need to do. How long does it take to get those medical, medical records? Medical records can take anywhere from, you know, a few days to several months, three or four months even, uh, depending on whether you're getting them out of the hospital that's large in its, you know, bureaucracy or they're mm -hmm. going to a small, you know, one doctor shop and, and he can get someone to copy the records and get them right out to you. So there's a wide variance. That's what that, so we have that difference of like 60 to 90 days to get through the process to sometimes greater than six months. Mm -hmm. And it really all focuses on the time that it takes to get someone's medical records. Mm -hmm. um, now you hear about you know patient doctor confidentiality all the time. Can a can a medical institution actually refuse to provide those medical records to you? They they sh they could and they should if they don't have a proper form uh, releasing those medical records to us. Mm -hmm. But as part of the package, we do have them signed a uh, medical release form that allows us to pull that medical information from the doctors they tell us about. Can the insurer ever try to uh, persuade them not to provide those medical records or if they, if you have the correct forms, there's nothing they can do about it, you, they have to give you those medical records? Right, yeah, okay. I mean, they, certainly any, anybody can probably raise an issue just about anything, but uh, in the idea that we have all the proper uh, forms in place, they should release those medical records to us. Mm -hmm. And it's, in, and obviously the whole process is something um, that someone does not have to go through. This is, okay. this is a, an opportunity for someone to find additional value out of a life insurance policy for most cases that they're, that they're looking at surrendering or lapsing. Okay. So really where it comes down to is this is a, a kind of a second option for them to uh, take the power away from an insurance company and simply letting it lapse with them and uh, take it to open market and see if there's a, a larger fair market value for the policy than what they're offering to surrender it. Mm -hmm. I use an analogy of the idea if you bought your home and you were told that only the builder could buy your home back from you, you'd think that was kind of crazy. Right. So in the idea that we're uh, now in a case where you have a fair market, you know, for a f determining fair market value or an outside market, secondary market for these policies, mm -hmm. allow that to operate, allow that marketplace to determine what its fair market value is. A lot of times policies don't price above what they can be surrendered for. Mm -hmm. um, but certainly when you're inside of uh, 15 years down to really that, uh, uh, high point is somewhere between eight and nine years of life expectancy. Policies usually always price at that point unless their yearly costs are absolutely outrageous. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. allow, allow the policy, allow the opportunity for a life settlement to work. They don't work for everyone. Mm -hmm. How do the insurers feel about life settlements, you know, the major companies? Well, all the major companies will fire their agents on the spot for talking about them, and they certainly don't have any love lost for this, this industry as a whole. They've mm -hmm. spent quite a bit of money, you know, uh, refuting or lobbying against this. Is that uh, right? This, this, uh, so this is avenue. something the insurers don't want, don't, don't want the word to get out on. Well, no, because back to the numbers, we were talking about uh, viability of policies and how what percentages are paid out. Mm -hmm. um, uh, Milliman and Robertson, um, an insurance uh, industry consulting firm, suggests that only 12% of universal policies are paid, therefore 88% of those policies never pay out a death benefit. Wow. So if you could sell a product and only have to pay out 12% of the time, you really wouldn't like those policies to, to go onto the marketplace because once they're sold in a life settlement, all the premiums are going to be paid mm -hmm. and indeed they're going to be paid out at the end. So it's a windfall for the insurers. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. um, you mentioned uh, uh, policies and death paying benefits. Can you expand upon that a little bit? Well, yeah, again, the uh, statistics were, were being quoted is that 12% of the time policies, uh, universal policies pay a death benefit. The invert of that is 88% of the time they don't pay a death they benefit. And death. that is crazy. On a, on a term life insurance policy, it's only 2% of the time that a death benefit's ever paid. Mm -hmm. So therefore, 98% of the time they never pay a, mm -hmm. a death benefit. So again, the insurance companies have made a living and a consistent living off of the idea of policies usually lapsing. Okay. Usually people get to a point in their older age, they can't afford these, to carry these policies and anymore. And the insurers are counting on that probably. And they're absolutely counting on that. Mm -hmm. And uh, again, the idea that they can come in and get a, uh, a fair market value that's greater than what they have as a cash surrender value, 
leaves the consumer to win. It's a win-win for the consumer every time. If it doesn't work, there's no upfront cost to this at all, and certainly they don't have to complete a transaction that doesn't pay them more than their surrender value. Mm -hmm. So there's absolutely no, no risk for the, for the policy owner to at least explore it to find out what their options are. That is absolutely correct. Other than the release of their medical records to, you know, to us to be able to determine their life expectancy report, um, there's, there's no risk, and that's not a risk because it is absolutely, per state law and the way we're regulated, it's absolutely uh, um, mm -hmm. confidential. There's, you know, it, it's only held to ourselves and then to a third party for the um, life expectancy reports to be generated. Mm -hmm. Are you charged to get those medical records? Is there a fee to you? Absolutely. And you don't pass that fee on to the policyholder? No, we don't. We charge no upfront fees for this, no whatsoever. So it's all on you? Absolutely. So we have to make a good good decision up front on whether this case is going to work or not, or we've wasted a lot of time and money. I can't see why someone wouldn't want to take advantage of a situation like that. I think, again, if we could we could turn that curve of the 85% of the marketplace knowing that we existed, um, you know, or not knowing we existed, and allow more people to know that we exist out here, uh, would certainly give an opportunity to a lot of people facing monetary troubles right now. I'd like to thank our guest, Ray Tolls, for being here today. We realize we've thrown a lot of info at you and that you may have questions. If you'd like to view this program again, please visit my website at markremey.org. You will see a link to this show on the website. Remember, if you have questions, just email us. Our emails are listed on the screen below, or you can visit the website. We will read and answer some of your questions on our next show. On behalf of my friend and colleague, Ray Tolls, thank you for watching Financial Solutions with Mark Ramey. We will see you next time.